वॉट इज शिवा और हु इज शिवा ही इज एन अमेशन ऑफ एवरीथिंग दैट यू कैन थिंक ऑफ गुड बैड अगली वी स्टार्टेड फीलिंग द लेयर्स ऑफ लाइफ वी फाउंड नथिंग सो वी सेट शिवा दैट विच इज नॉट There are yogis with bangles, they have blocked off their right nostril with bee wax. They use this process to rise above the physical body. Tantra, Yantra, Mantra, does it depend on the sadhak? Tantra is mindless. What kind of miracle do you want to cause? Accordingly, you use the tantra. The seven chakras on Dhyana Lingam. Does it have anything to do with Kundalini? Kundalini, when it rises, what you thought was humanly impossible becomes a living possibility. Dhyanalinga will last even beyond the life of this planet because it's lifted itself up from the stone form. जय 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 महादेव जय 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 महादेव शिव शंकर आदि अनंत शिव शंकर आदि अनंत जय 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 महादेव नमस्कार नमस्कार एंड हियर वी हैव विवेक देव रॉय Well, this is India, where an economist will write scriptures. <laughs> this is the only civilization where such things are possible. He is an economic advisor in the highest office in the country, but uh, I don't know how he finds time on the side to produce these monumental works with Mahabharat and now this. So, this is fantastic about this civilization, that generally, in most parts of the world, the moment people become intellectually very active, first thing that happens to them is, inevitably they have to distance themselves from what is normally referred to as organized religion because it will never fit into the framework of a working intellect. This is a unique civilization. Only if you exercise your intellect to a certain level, only then this, what we call as Sanatan Dharm or the Hindu way of life fits into your brain, otherwise it doesn't. <laughs> so, uh, here we have Vivek Dev Roy, very celebrated economist and now I think he's going to be more known for these things than his economic <laughs> in future. <laughs> so I will leave it to him because he is the scholar and I'm the ignorant one here. <laughs> Thank you Sadhguru and uh, Namaste everyone. The first good fortune that I have is that I have the good fortune, accidentally or otherwise, to be translating into English in unabridged form from the Sanskrit. My intention is to do the 18 Mahapuranas, Ashtadash Mahapurana. The Shiva Purana, obviously it's about Shiva. It's a very long Purana, 
25,000 shlokas, 700,000 words. These three volumes of the Shiva Purana are dedicated to Sadguru. <laughs> Here we are in Isha, in front of all of you, with me in the privileged position of asking Sadguru questions about Shiva. So let me first ask Sadguru, what is Shiva? Or who is Shiva? I don't know if I can blow away the audience with my answers, but the wind is definitely doing it. <laughs> so, because uh, you have used two aspects to refer to Shiva, one is what is it, another is who is it. Normally this doesn't happen, you ask who is this, you ask what is this, but you're using both the terms, what is it and who is it. In many ways, that is answer. It is <laughs> it is uh, it, it is him and it's beyond that. Well, because we are using words, we have to sound logically sensible, which is an onerous task. I've been grappling with the task all my life, how to make the intangible, the transcendent, sound very logically correct. Because logic is the language of transaction, language is a transaction. To bring transcendence into this transaction has been my work. Well, some understand or so they think, some misunderstand, some mesmerized, some dismissive, all these things happen. The moment you open your mouth, you should know all these things will happen to you because you're trying to make the transcendent, transactional. There is no way or no other way to deal with the larger world. If you do not want the I'm very consciously using my words. If you do not want to dabble with the corruption of transaction, because no transaction is perfect, all transactions, if you look at it this way, it looks one way, if you look at it that way, it looks another way. It all depends from which side you're looking at it. So the moment you dabble with transactions, you're uh, taking the risk of looking maligned. You may not be maligned, but you look maligned because people have a very uh, unrealistic, sanitized idea of purity which never happens, that's why they never get there, because they have an impractical idea. In that context, Shiva comes to assistance because you can't put him in that purified, sanitized way. He's everything at once. So this... this personality, or this persona, that he's in the company of distorted beings, he wears a bleeding elephant skin, that means freshly slain elephant skin, he's drunk, inebriated, <laughs> uh, he's many other positive things also because 
what you consider as positive, very easy to come to terms with it. What you consider as negative, very hard to come to terms with it. So I'm only talking about the negative. So he is an amalgamation of everything that you can think of. Positive, good, bad, ugly, let me put it this way in modern terminology. <laughs> Everything is in one man. Why is the man like this? Because a man is just a personification of both manifest and unmanifest creation. He is nothing and everything at the same time. Shiva means that which is not. He is that which is not. At the same time, he is Mahadeva, that means he is the source of creation also, and he is a destroyer also, all in one. Well, that's how creation is happening, all in one. Nothing is happening separately. So I'm saying, our logical minds have single-minded focus or a keyhole vision of everything, so very hard to come to terms with Shiva. People can worship him from a distance, but if there was a man like that around you, you can't come to terms with him. So you cannot accept him, but you worship him, which is not great. You first accept somebody, then you can love someone, then you can become worshipful. <laughs> you straight away become worshipful is for your own needs. You are bridging your inability to do things. Closing your eyes to something is not facing reality. Closing your eyes to something is a not, not the way of knowing what it is. So, because it is both manifest and unmanifest, this keyhole way of looking at things. When I say keyhole way, this has been our idea of science that we are looking at everything separately. Just… just three, four or maybe five decades ago, medical science was functioning like this. People thought liver is one thing, heart is another thing, brain is another thing, spleen is another thing, gut is another thing. But today we know medical sciences are no more talking on those terms. They are saying, uh, there is more brain in your gut than in your brain, and there's more shit in your brain than in your gut <laughs> It's a fact, there's a gut brain <laughs> Well, in yoga, the word yoga means this, you see everything in union. So for a yogi, Shiva is a natural resort, because uh, he is that union personified. So, when… to answer the first part of the question, what is it? It is not it. Well, today modern science also is entering the sphere. For a long time, we thought everything is some kind of mass and energy and this and that, but now we know mass is a deception, everything is energy. Now we are beginning to see in fundamental physics that energy is also a deception. Everything comes from nothing and goes back to nothing. Socially, nothing is a bad word. If I tell somebody you are nothing, they will be insulted. So I think it's best we put a hyphen between no and thing. So when you frame the question, what is it? It's an inappropriate question, it is not it because it's nothing. Only a thing can be called it. And who is he? When you say who is he, it's a partially correct question, because anyone who realized the vastness of nothingness, because without knowing the core and the essence of creation, which is nothingness or no-thingness, you have no perception of anything. What you have perceived is all in bits and pieces. 
it is like perceiving through the senses or perceiving through our intellect or understanding through our intellect. And thinking we know something is like, if I give you a trillion piece jigsaw, you found twelve pieces and you put it together and then you say, oh, this is an elephant. But that's only twelve pieces of the trillion pieces. So whatever conclusions we draw with our senses, whatever conclusions we draw with our intellect, whatever conclusions we draw culturally, socially, have no meaning when you utter the word Shiva. Because it springs from the limitless nothingness, which is everywhere. Something is only somewhere. It is only nothing which is everywhere. Today, atomic scientists and cosmologists are beginning to say that over 99.9 percent .9 of the atom is empty, nothing. Not a lot of stuff, nothing. Over 99.9 .9 percent of the cosmos is also empty. And how can you ignore that? So, here in this civilization, we started peeling the layers of life, not going up there and doing it because that is an impractical way, because the individual is just a, a, a mini universe, and the individual is just a microscopic universe. So we started peeling this microcosm, which is myself right now. As we peeled and peeled and peeled, the entire culture focused on this, the whole civilization is built on this, going on peeling the human being. Then when we peeled totally, we found nothing. So we said, Shiva, that which is not. So thousands of years ago, we spoke that everything came from this nothingness. It is not a coincidence that mathematically, it is this civilization which produced a zero, nothing. Because Shiva means that, emptiness, nothingness. Today, after so much of research and looking at things, modern science is beginning to speak the same language. They're talking about the core of universe or the essence of universe is nothing. Because at the same time they are saying, till now, if anything has to do something, it has to be something. It must be electricity, it must be electromagnetism, it must be something, some force. Where there is no force of any kind, everything is obliterated. That is very powerful. So not knowing what to call it, they're calling it dark energy. Where we always refer to Shiva as the dark one. So, it's not a question I can answer, but I can transmit. I'm waiting for people to be ready for transmission. Till then I have to coax them. So I'm busy coaxing them, cajoling them, entertaining them. Maybe someday I'll get tired of entertaining them <laughs> No, I think… I think you have answered the question. But so far as the sagu saguna form is concerned, let's ignore the nirguna form for the moment. When we talk about Shiva's one hundred names or one thousand names or Ashtamurti, or Tatpurush to the east, Aghora to the south, and so on and so forth. Is it that these are manifestations, it, they are actual pieces of that jigsaw, of that huge, gigantic elephant? Or is it a problem with the person who's trying to perceive? Is it a keyhole problem? Or is it a bit of both? It is a keyhole problem. But maybe whoever spoke about this, they had the same problem that I have, trying to make the transcendent transactional. 
If you talk about infinity, nobody is going to get it. If you talk about a zillion, some people think they get it. You have to put a number. So if you say, he is nothing, nobody is going to get it. If you say he is one thousand and eight, some people who can count, they can get it. <laughs> so probably, the ancients, sages and seers had the same problem to make the transcendent, transactional. In that effort, they might have said whatever they might have said. In that case, what exactly is a lingam? I'm not necessarily talking about the Dhyana lingam or the Jyoti lingams yet, but in principle, what exactly is a lingam? Is that also transactional? Mm -hmm. The word uh, linga comes from the word lina. Essentially, it means the form. Everything is a form. This is the form. Why is it called the form is, today it is established beyond doubt. There are scientists who have computer simulations of what could have happened when the Big Bang happened. And the simulations show that an ellipsoid is formed. And today cosmologists who have been looking through powerful telescopes or through radio, waves and stuff like that, they're also saying the core of many galaxies are ellipsoid. There are more galaxies, nameless, countless number of galaxies which are ellipsoid in nature. But there are some which we observe more easily, which are mm, uh, spiral in nature. Spiraling galaxies are more visible because they're still expanding. Because they're expanding, they're full of gases which are turning into material, so their stars are burning bright, so you see them more observable. Galaxies which have more ellipsoid core are less observable because the gaseous... the gaseous levels there has lowered, the stars are not burning very bright. I must tell you this. Probably in seventies when uh, the American and Soviet competition or soft war, they call it what? Cold war. At that time, everybody wanting to prove who is scientifically more advanced than the other. Unfortunately, they're again back to the same game. <laughs> now. So they wanted to explore, both the countries wanted to explore a nuclear device, a very powerful nuclear device on the moon. And they would have done it. The only reason why they did not do it is, they realized if they explode a nuclear bomb on the planet, it will create a huge fireball like a sun about the same temperature as the core of the sun and a mushroom cloud and all this. All this won't happen on the moon because there is no atmosphere. You can't even see in the blast, it may be just a small cracker. So then they gave up because they can't create the drama on the planet. If you looked at the moon today, it is burning with a nuclear explosion and uh, we can claim we did it. That's how crude we've become, all right <laughs> but. They didn't do it, fortunately there is no atmosphere in moon. If it blasts, you can't really make out much. So this is what I am saying, where there are no gases, where the gaseous material... gaseous material is limited or thin, there you cannot see the brightness of the burning star. So because of this, the elliptical core... the galaxies with elliptical cores are less visible. Galaxies which are spiral, are more visible. But it's well established that the core of most galaxies are ellipsoid in nature, elliptical. Even the solar system is in elliptical in its motion. So ellipse is a natural form that happens because 
when that which is unmanifest begins to manifest, the first form is an ellipse or an ellipsoid. A three-dimensional ellipse is an ellipsoid. And we know this from our experience that if we become meditative to a point where your contact with your physical body becomes very minimal, you are not, almost not the body, then once again our energies take the form of a ellipsoid. So this perfect ellipsoid is a linga, as you see, they are sitting there in the water. So, <clears throat> this is called a linga because this is the beginning, this is the end. Or let's look at it this way, this is the front door to creation and this is the back door to creation. You can enter whichever way you want. What specifically is a Swayambhu lingam or a Jyotir lingam? When we say Swayambhu, it means self-creative. That means we did not take the trouble of making a form. We found a natural form which sort of went with the dimensions that we want and we chose to make that into our linga and a point of worship and a point of power to consecrate that itself as a linga. When you say Jyotir linga, well, today there is a very, uh, very, what to say, a very narrow understanding what this is. There are only twelve Jyotirlingas. It's not like that. Anything Jyoti means light. Why light is important to us is because uh, <laughs> our visual apparatus are such that we can see things only when there is light. If you were made like an owl, we would uh, not value Jyotirlinga, we would want darklingas, <laughs> all right? So because we can see only when there is light, when a linga becomes a source of light for us, allows us to see things, allows us to experience things, allows us to perceive things beyond our normal perception or experience, then we call it a Jyotirlinga. Are there only twelve? Not necessarily, twelve has been created as a part of the tradition, because these uh, twelve lingas have their kumbhajivishekams and special events. So because the twelve parts of the zodiac and the twelve months in a year, we have limited it to twelve, otherwise it'll become too many to visit. <laughs> each, each one of them typically has a story. So do you have a favorite story connected with any of the twelve jyotirlingams? Uh, <laughs> I... We are not going to take I, no, I am, pick one over that. No, no, not like that. I am completely spiritually ignorant. I... Not because of any disdain or lack of respect, I just never had the time to read any scripture in my life. If I have time, I close my eyes and sit, because this scripture, was written by Shiva himself. I don't wish to read any other scripture, because I know human beings are capable of distortion. I'm sorry I'm not uh, talking about the book. No, 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 we don't <laughs> want to talk about the book. They can read the book, they can't hear I'm saying it. human mind is such, no matter how sincere they are in what they're doing, they can still distort things. This is the nature of human mind, because Information comes in bits and pieces. To assimilate all that and make a perfect picture is all nearly impossible. So, this was written by the creator himself. So, I only read this. If I have time, I read this and nothing else, because this is a microcosm of creation. And if you read this for a million years, it will not be complete. So, I have not found time. But I went to Ujjain because my guru went there and <laughs> these because he's uh, he's been the induction for me. Well. Uh, 
everything, sadhanas and studies and everything was done elsewhere. But without that induction, nothing happened. So many things happened, but nothing was worthwhile. Because he went there and I knew he went there and so I went there. And uh, Ujjain is uh, Mahakal. Mahakal means great nothingness or great time. In this language, the Sanskrit language, you are an expert, I am not. Kala means time. Kala also means darkness. Darkness means nothingness. Darkness is possible only where there is nothing. Well, here there is air, but real darkness is possible because air also reflects some amount of light. Not enough for human eye to catch it, but it does stop some amount of... because air is not absolutely pure. You come from Delhi, you know air can be seen <laughs> Air is a visible element in Delhi <laughs> So, uh, space is darkness because there is nothing. So, kala means time, kala means darkness, kala means space. We have the same word for space and time or time and space. So, he is maha mahakal where he is empty. Well, everybody has definitely heard about Shiva means third eye, it's become symbolic. So artists draw one big eye here. Well, Shiva was not such a freak with his uh, forehead split open. Third eye means your perception has risen beyond your sense perception. These two eyes can see only what light stop, what stops light. See, right now you can see my hand because it's stopping light. You cannot see the air because it's not stopping light. It's as simple as that. So only that which is opaque you can see. That is a very limited way of seeing. When ninety-nine percent, ninety-nine point nine percent of the existence is... doesn't stop light, you cannot see. So ninety-nine point nine percent of the existence is completely missed. So Mahakal means that, that he is a great nothingness and you can call him great timelessness or eternity because Kala, time and space, we don't separate as two things. Today, modern physics still looks at things like this. Because there is space, you need time to travel from point A to point B. In yoga, we do not see it like that. We see, because there is time, you can travel from point A to point B. Point A and point B becomes a possibility. Here and there becomes a possibility only because there is now and then. Only because there is now and then, here and there becomes possible. But if you look at creation very closely, there is only now then there is only here, there is no here and there. So space is a consequence of time. So Mahakal represents these two aspects and uh, the third eye, Shiva opened his eyes and burnt somebody. He burnt a symbol of passion, he burnt Kama. Tell me, is Kama floating in the air or is it within, within us? It is only within us. So, third eye is an inward eye. He opened it and burnt his karma. That means every passion, everything that he liked and disliked, because both like and dislike are passion. Somebody can go at somebody with great passion of love or hate. So, he burnt all likes, dislikes, everything that mattered. So, this is why. Mahakal is still represented or even still adorned with ash from the cremation grounds because some silly activists protesting against it, unfortunately, they had changed it to cow dung based or uh, paddy husk based 
ash. So when I went there and I found out, I told the uh, priest there and also the chief minister, I said, you must change this. Who are those idiots who are protesting? You're only taking ash from the dead, you're not killing anybody, every day somebody is dying, you don't have to kill somebody to get ash from the cremation ground. And now it seems they once again started that process, because ash is the symbolism of all that is caused by elements is gone. All that has a propensity of going this way or that way is gone. A certain stillness has risen, that is ash. Well, people who look at physical world only, they may think ash is the end point of destruction. Yes, it is. In a way, Shiva means that, the end point. This is why he is referred to as the destroyer, but he is also Mahadeva. So, Linga is both the beginning of creation and the end of creation. Both ways there will be an ellipsoid. So, Linga is significant. If you want to go this way or that way, both ways Linga is significant. Then we learned how to manifest Linga with various qualities and accordingly, different qualities, whatever people need, accordingly they did. Those cultures which are very focused on material well-being of human beings, created Manipuraka lingas. Somewhere as far as Greece in Delphi, there is a Manipuraka linga. When I heard that there is a navel of the earth, it's called. Then when I just heard this name, I knew I had to go there. I went there and uh, they have created a large linga. Indian yogis went there some four thousand three hundred or four hundred years ago and created a Manipuraka... Manipura linga, which was worshipped and celebrated, but today, due to changes that have happened in the denominations that, de you know, demographics has taken to, it is just a monument now. So, Linga is removed from its original place and kept inside the museum. But even inside the museum, it is still reverberating with energy after four thousand odd years. The fantastic consecration, whoever did it. How long does the energy last in a lingam? Is it... or does it depend on who has done the concentrating? It depends on how it is done. See, if it is done with mantras and pujas and other processes, they have to maintain that, otherwise it'll die. So what about something like the dhyana lingam? So if it is done in that way, through technologies, of inner energies, if you do it in that way, that also depends on how it is done and what kind of material. If the material is such that it is capable of holding it for long periods of time, it can last very long, beyond what people think of time. Let us say there are lingas, there is a linga in Koina, which is also thrown outside in the garden, which is slightly cracked even still reverberating. So these are all ancient temples which have been destroyed and today many other things have been built over that. So this destruction and building of other religious places is not just an Indian problem, it has happened across Arabia and Europe. So it is just that it happened long time ago, here it happened more recently. So this... how long, what is the age? Well, let me start at the highest level, because you asked about Dhyanalinga. Dhyanalinga, the form of Dhyanalinga will last even beyond the life of this planet. It's like Markandai, because it is not rooted in the form anymore, it's up. Because it's lifted itself up from the stone form that we have created, whatever happens, it will still be there. People who are sensitive will recognize this, but people need a form to see, otherwise they cannot recognize it, most people. But those who are sensitive will recognize this, cobras will recognize it, I trust them. They will always recognize. Human beings, if there is no proper temple, if there is no process, if you don't create an atmosphere, they miss everything <laughs> because they are too enamored with their own cerebral activity. Everyone who follows you knows you're fond of dancing. 
the Nataraja form. I am not dancing every day, sir. Only once a year I am maybe dancing these days. <laughs> Earlier I was dancing little more, but these days there's too much crowd. Can't dance anywhere. <laughs> the Nataraja form is probably one of your favorite forms of Shiva, at least you've spoken about it. So people have asked me, and as I said, it's much better you answer the question, particularly because you have talked about Shiva's third eye. What is the significance of Andhaka at the bottom of Nataraja? So, uh, you know, Andha means blind. When you say Andha or Andhaka, you're talking about darkness or blindness, to be correct. When we talk about light, we're talking about vision. When we talk about darkness, we are talking about being blind. Our problems with darkness is only that we turn blind. Otherwise, what's our problem with darkness? Rest of the things that people suffer is their own imagination. They've been watching horror movies or they're producing their own horror movies. Otherwise, there's no other problem with darkness, a yogi loves darkness. But he loves darkness because he can practice seeing in darkness. So once you see in darkness, where is darkness? Definitely below your feet. So Shiva is a symbolism of that. He can see in darkness because there is no light and darkness for him. Because light is a brief happening. When I say brief happening, this bulb these days, they are claiming they have a thousand hour life. The sun may have a billion years, but that'll also go off one day. Anything that burns will run out someday. It has to fuse. So light is a consequence of something burning somewhere. It is a very temporary happening. In the cosmic drama, it's a very temporary happening. So what you see as Nataraja is a symbolism of cosmos. But as human beings, if everything is darkness, we can't see a thing. We need light. So we need to stand upon darkness and see. That is the symbolism of Nataraja, he's standing upon darkness and he's light. Well, he's the dark one, but he is dancing. Today, I think particles physics and other fundamental physics, people who are deep into it, are beginning to say the only way they can describe the phenomena of particles and energy happening, the waves, particles and the mixture of all this happening is, it looks like it's a dance. So it's not by accident that the sun uh, <laughs> research center has Nataraja planted in front of this laboratory because that is the only way you can make something coherent out of the creation. It looks like a dance because it looks chaotic on one level, but it is in some kind of symmetry. This is how everything is about creation. See, someone who creates gardens would think a forest is disorganized, chaotic, everything is everywhere. But <laughs> A forest can last a million years without any management or maintenance. A garden, if you don't maintain for a month, it is forest. So tell me which is better organized. It is just that if we have a very linear vision of looking at everything in compartments, it doesn't make sense that light and darkness is together. But it's not together. Light is standing upon darkness, even now. Light is valuable only because there is darkness, otherwise who would care for light? 
Who would care for the sun if there was no darkness? In the space, light is standing upon darkness. So is Shiva standing upon darkness. Earlier you mentioned Bhashma, hopefully from cremation grounds. <laughs> In comparison to something like Ujjayin, the importance of Bhashma, Rudraksha, uh, the three marks of Bhashma, Tripurandra, here, seem to be relatively less in Isha than elsewhere. Is that a perception or is it because those, as you said, require frequent energizing? Or is that just a misconception? I think a lot of people, I see at least the girls are all wearing vibhuti on their forehead. They're also putting it their earlobes also on their vishuddhi. Because their sadhana is focused in that region. So does it depend on the nature of the sadhana? Uh, see, we are not carried away by any tradition. Because, as I said, anything that you give it to a bunch of human beings, they will distort it in no time. What is symbolic, if you start thinking it is absolute, that will be... it'll become comic. Lot of people have this thing, they're usually beggars who are dressed like Shiva. Uh, they can't go and kill an elephant or a tiger. They don't know the difference between uh, a cheetah and a tiger or a leopard and a tiger. They're wearing leopard skin that they get in some cheap local market, some cloth like that. And they're smeared from head to toe. If they could not make dreadlocks, they'll wear a wig like that. You are making a caricature of it. He lived in the wild. So naturally hair becomes deadlocked, dreadlocked. Ah, where do you go and weave a cloth? So he has a large retinue of people. The only thing he can eat is some big animal, elephant, where elephants were plenty. So they slew elephants and ate them and wore the skin around. Most practical thing to do for the time and the situation that he's in. You don't have to do the same thing today. It would be completely mockery of his existence. So, what is done in one time, if you do the same thing in another time when times have changed and he's become irrelevant, without understanding the fundamentals of what it is, the important thing is, if basma is just being used as a symbolism, you can put it all over your body. But if you're using it as a way to sensitize certain aspects of who you are, then it need to be applied only in certain points of your body. In yoga, for different types of sadhanas, for different types of attainments that one may be seeking, basma is applied in different ways. But here, I believe all these fools are seeking enlightenment. Hello? Not power over somebody, not occult, not to get powers to burn somebody down, nothing. They want their own liberation. They're seeking liberation. Ah, there are just a few aspects which are important, only there they're applying. Is that equally true of things like tantra, yantra? Mantra, does it depend on the sadhak and the sadhana? Yes, fundamentally it's the orientation, what are you seeking, first of all? See, it's like technology, because when you use the word tantra, essentially you're talking a technique or a technology. Tantra does not mean, <laughs> a, uh, you know, unbridled promiscuousness as today American tantra is going. It means it's a technology. What is the greatest technology on the planet? Well, human system is the greatest technology on the planet. Learning to use this in many different ways, not just survival process of eating, sleeping, reproducing and dying, which is what most human beings are doing, but this technology can be enhanced to use in a completely different way. 
See, we dig the earth. If you look at uh, ancient civilizations, whenever archaeologists dig up some place, they said, uh, now near Kurukshetra, they are digging up uh, an archaeological site which is bigger than Mahanjadaro. This ar archaeologist was telling me, I want to see the place. Rakhi Gari. <laughs> yeah. So, what is one thing that they will find? One thing that they will find is burnt clay, either pottery or bricks. Thousands of years later, burnt clay remains. What does burnt clay mean? Generally pottery, bricks also sometimes. What's so big about a pot? But when that is the first container that you ever made, it was bigger than anything, it is bigger than your spacecraft. You went to the river, you drank water. If you want to drink water again, you had to go back to the river. But if you could hold it in a container and bring it home, that was a revolution. So pot was a fantastic thing that we made out of soil. Today we dig the same soil and build a computer. Out of the same soil, we build a spacecraft. Same soil, same soil, we build this human body. Even then they were doing it, but similarly the same human being. You can just do mundane things and go, or you can do magical things and go. So what sort of magic you want to do? People are always asking, Sadhguru, can you perform some miracle? <laughs> I usually tell them, see if you want I can pull out a pigeon from my pocket and give it to you. What will you have? You will have a bird, I'll have a shitty pocket. That's all that'll happen. <laughs> what do you do with this? But I can perform a different kind of miracle that if you do what I tell you, this is not in withdrawal from active life, actively involved with life, daily handling every kind of issue and problem in the world. But you never get angry, you never get irritated, you never fall off the rails. This is a miracle. This is a miracle we need in the world today. Human intelligence and technologies, outside technologies have gone through the ceiling, but we are making such a mess out of it, such an absolute mess out of it. Right now, everybody is talking about some movie where uh, the scientist who first produced the atomic bomb, well, this is a misuse of human intelligence. Today we may think it's a great strategic weapon, because every idiot has done it, we also have to do it. But I'm saying this is a terrible misuse of human intelligence. One mistake, everything could go wrong, just everything. Well, in so many other ways, look at this unseen. Science means essentially understanding of the manifest world or the physical phenomena. Our understanding of the physical phenomena, what we call a science, and the consequence or the consequent technologies that we have evolved, they have caused the maximum damage to this planet and life on this planet, yes or no? Unfortunately, what should have been the greatest boon in our lives, which also has brought many positive things, but we are driving ourselves to destruction using science and technology. If we were illiterate, if we did not know all these things, ah, we would still be angry, we would still kill each other, we would still fight, but with sticks and stones. Ah, but today we can destroy the whole everything, all right? So, empowerment is a terrible possibility if enlightenment doesn't happen. Empowerment of humanity is a horrendous possibility without enlightenment. So here, I'm... I'm catering to only those who are focused on enlightenment. So only certain things are done, other things we don't go, because tantra has various aspects, like technology can save your life or can take your life. More is invested in taking life than saving life, that's an unfortunate mentality of our world.
but it can save your life, it can make your life, in how many ways it has enhanced our lives, but at the same time, it is holding a gun to every one of our heads all the time. Because technology is mindless, it is in whose hands it is which determines. Similarly, tantra is mindless, who holds it will determine what happens out of it. Will you produce pigeons out of your pocket or will you make peaceful, blissful, will you make people peaceful, blissful, joyful and capable of doing things which are beneficial to themselves and to everybody else around them? What kind of miracle do you want to cause? Accordingly, you use the tantra. What's, what's the significance of the seven chakras on Dhyanalingam? Does it have anything to do with Kundalini or is it something else? Uh, <laughs> if you use the word Kundalini, some people think it's a film actress, <laughs> okay? <laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> Kundalini is a word used to talk about energy in the system. See, right now I'm speaking, this is Kundalini. People are listening, that is also Kundalini. Dog is barking, that is also Kundalini. Wind is blowing. That is also Kundalini. So I am saying everything that drives the physical world is referred to as Kundalini. But when we refer to this in terms of human system, we are talking about generally, it is to be understood that we are talking about latent energy, unused energy. See, just an hour ago, the wind was not blowing with this force. Air was still there, but it was not blowing, now it's blowing. What caused it? Well, just some differences. It is the same air. Nobody is blowing air from another space or another planet into this planet's atmosphere. Same atmosphere, it's placid or it becomes like this. Similarly, your energies can be placid, doing simple things or it can rise and do things that you can't imagine. So we are talking about that latent energy which is unused or unmanifest but exists within us. Till it rises, you cannot believe it existed within you. It is always symbolized as a cobra, coiled up cobra. And its rise also is generally uh, symbolized with the cobra's movement because generally people see a cobra only when they step on it or something provokes it and it starts moving in a certain way. If it is sitting still, most people will not see it because it sits so still. It takes a special eye to see them. Otherwise, if it's simply sitting still, most people will not see it, they may be walking close by. If it sits still, they won't see it. So when cobra it moves out of provocation, it moves in a jerky way. Bus, bus, you know, everybody thinks snake is always doing bus. <laughs> it's not always doing that. But when it's provoked, it breathes out like that. So it is referred to as a live cobra which rises when provoked. So you can either rise it, raise it with provocation or raise it gently. So you will see <laughs> in our programs, you must come sir sometime, in our programs we will see people are sitting, some people are going crazy, oh, woo and all this, some people are simply sitting still. Different ways in which Kundalini behaves, depending upon various aspects, Depends how big the rock is which is sitting on the coiled up snake. If the rock is very small, it'll put it aside and go smoothly. If it's big, it struggles and you will see all kinds of things happening. So the word Kundalini essentially in usage 
though in its larger context means something else, in usage, we are talking about that unmanifest energy within us, which can rise. And when it rises, what you thought was humanly impossible becomes a living possibility. Above all, in the yogic system and also in the tantric systems, because they are not too different, we just call it yoga and tantra yoga. It is like science and technology, <laughs> almost like that. Science is called yoga, technology is called tantra. Because tantra has become a very bad connotation today, we refuse to use that word, because immediately tantra means people think all kinds of weird things. No, tantra means you're using the external to create an inner situation. Yoga means it's an inner discipline, completely internalized. In today's world, it is better, it is internalized. Even today, after many years, only now I've brought a few rituals into the yoga center. Otherwise, this was completely a ritualistic process. Because a ritual is a fantastic thing. When the people who conduct it are a certain level of integrity, Ritual is beautiful, colorful, it is something that everybody can participate in. Now if I teach meditation, few people will immediately fall into it, very simply. Others will struggle, all they know is ankle pain, back pain, bum pain, what not, all kinds of things, that's all they know. They're striving still, but it's like that. Because not everybody is made the same way, they will need more application. Some people will settle down simply, some people will have to struggle. Everybody can get there one day, but some will need more application than the other. But a ritual is not like that. It is conducted by somebody, just by participating you can benefit. But the problem with the ritual is it can be easily misused. So this is why rituals have got a bad name because it's been so horribly misused over a period of time. So, first twenty, twenty-five, nearly, I would say, nearly thirty years, there has not been a single ritual here. It's only now, in the last eight to ten years, there is Devi, there is some ritual, otherwise this place was completely a-ritualistic. Now we've brought, because today, I can proudly say we have created people here, that you give them a mountain of gold, they're not even interested in looking at it. So rituals are possible. <laughs> so, uh, rituals are a beautiful way of doing things, but because of the bad, what to say, karma of misuse, it is to be done in a minimal way. If you can establish a very profound level of integrity, then you can do it. Otherwise, over a period of time, it'll be misused. Meditative processes, yogic processes are completely internalized. There is no chance of misuse. But at the same time, it is not as simple and easy and mass production as a ritual. It is very individual, it takes so much time to instruct them, takes so much time to make them understand, takes much more time to commit them for long-term participation, because if you teach them something, there are... you know, the percentage of people continuing to doing the inner engineering practices is very high compared to most other places on the world... in the, on the planet. But still, there are thousands and thousands of people who say, Sadhguru, first three months I did Shambhavi, it was so wonderful, I got so busy, then I gave it up. So these kind of people are thousands because to teach them it takes so much time, to get them committed it takes so much time, for them to remain committed you have to constantly keep in touch, running satsangs all over the world. It's a lot of expense, pain and work to keep them committed to their well-being. You, you've already uh, answered this but let me ask even then, What's it with the Naga, the Cobra? We are sitting in front of one. <laughs> I have not been to the Isha Center in Bangalore, I understand. Naga is very important there. Nagas are very important to Shiva. So what is it with Nagas? 
Say Anand. Wherever there has been mysticism, wherever there has been extrasensory perception, there always the snake is. If you look at any ancient culture, if you look at African occult, it's full of snakes. If you look at Christian mysticism, even Moses is carrying a snake-like stick because he couldn't carry a cobra, you know, by the time they took it from India, it would be dead. <laughs> and they're in a desert <laughs> So, something related to the snake is always there. There's no Indian temple without a snake image. Wherever there is a Jyotirlinga, that means which there is a... there is some cascade of grace, there is light for people, there, there will be a downward moving snake, at least one snake in the temple somewhere. All of them will be this way, one will be like this. Here in Dhyanalinga you see, there are many, many downward flowing snakes because this is to indicate the cascade of grace. Here we have the advantage of being at the foothills of Velangiri mountains. It is called the Kailash of the South, Shiva himself. The legend says he spent over three and a half months here in a very different kind of mood and mode. And so it acquired a very special quality and it bred a completely different kind of mysticism around this mountain. So we are in a cascade of gay grace and plus Dhyanalinga together, it is a big cascade of grace. And we are at eleven degrees latitude, which is very important because of the the tilt that the planet has and the spin it has, the maximum amount of centrifuge happens at approximately eleven degrees latitude and we are sitting right on that right now. So that means there's a natural upsurge of energy, all this put together. About the snake, particularly about the cobra, I must tell you, there were times when Earlier in my life, uh, when I sat in the jungles around my shore or in different parts of Western Ghats, I don't know why, because everybody traditionally they meditate either in the morning or in the night or in the evening. I always meditated in the afternoon. <laughs> I don't know why, at that time I just meditated always in the afternoon. If I sit for a few hours and open my eyes, twelve, fifteen cobras would be sitting right in front of me because they have this perception. The moment you... the energy shifts, they love it and they're there. So, about Adiyogi or Shiva carrying a cobra around his neck, it is a reptile, a crawly creature, it should be at least down there, but no, it's right up till here, right next to him, in a way, Shiva is making a point, he's as good as me in perception. Because perception is the core of yoga. Without perception, what do you know? If you were blind, how many things would you know? If you were deaf, how many things would you know? If you couldn't feel, how many things would you know? Just like that, perception is the basis of who we are right now. How profound is your perception? determines how profound is your experience of life and how profound is your knowing. So entire thing is about perception. All sadhana is about enhancing your perception, not enhancing your knowledge, it's about enhancing your perception. When I walk on the street, I'm more ignorant than a village bumpkin. I know nothing, but my lights are on. Because you need to see, you don't have to think. Everybody thinks they need to think. Thinking means what? Recycling what little we already know. Waste of time. If you're thinking all the time, you must know you're just wasting away your life, recycling the same things that you have known for a long time. What you read, what you <laughs> saw in your childhood, you're still thinking about it. 
what somebody said, you're still thinking about it, what you said, you're still thinking about it. Endlessly thinking means you're just recycling things that you already know. That means you're not interested in perception. You are trying to make something out of yourself. You do not still know the value of nothingness. You're trying to make something out of yourself. You're trying to make, build an image of what it is. So perception is the core of yoga. Perception is the core of mysticism. Perception is the core of tantra. Without perception, there is nothing. Everybody is perceiving what the eyes can see, but to perceive that that everybody cannot see or fail to see is the important thing. So, for example, a cobra, which is right now in Wellingri Hills, if there is going to be, not happening, if there is going to be an earthquake, let's say in California, I'm saying California because it's almost directly opposite on the other side of the planet, the cobra will start behaving in different ways. Right now in China, they have made an institute where to detect earthquakes just observing snakes. If you just observe them, if you learn to read their movements and behavior, behavior, if there is going to be an earthquake, you already know. Because they are so sensitive, because they are stone deaf, they are ear to the ground, literally, <laughs> you know? <laughs> their whole body is to the ground, feeling every tremor. So it's not only about tremors in the earth, but they have a different level of perception. This perception gives them an extraordinary sense about certain energies. So naturally, you will see lots of videos going around in the social media these days, how huge snakes are encircling Linga somewhere in one temple and it comes at a certain time, whatever. Some things may be staged, but it is... it is not an empty legend. There is sense to it, because I'm telling you in my own experience, if I sit and become in a certain way, they would gather around me. This has been the experience of every yogi that they came. Many yogis always carried a cobra. So probably Moses heard about it from people who are going from here, because Indian traders and yogis have been going to that part of the world for over eight to ten thousand years. To such an extent, cities were built just on the taxes that were levied on Indian traders, like Aleppo is one city, which is unfortunately in ruins, Palmyra is another city. They were all, these were all built only on the taxes levied on Indian traders. To that extent, people who are going, traveling in those days over... Even if you take from Gujarat, which is the westernmost part of present India, it was uh, nearly three thousand plus kilometers or miles. And uh, still people traveled to that extent, streams of trading goods were going and along with that yogis and mystics, everybody traveled. So having a snake will give you extra sensory perception. So people carried snake, uh, snake-like sticks and walked around. All these things are there. But the important thing is, there are... <laughs> because they're all young people, I hesitate to say certain things. <laughs> in... Uh, particularly in Himachal, also in some parts of Western Ghats, in the east, around Vishakapatnam, in that area, there are yogis who uh, generally have... Uh, they may carry a cobra with them, but these days, no. They usually have green glass bangles on their left hand. And uh, they have, if you observe them closely, they have blocked off their right nostril with bee wax for one solar cycle, twelve and a quarter years, only one nostril breathing. Normally it'll kill you, because one way of noticing death is coming is your breathing will shift to just one nostril. Doesn't shift from one to another every forty minutes as it should, it stays on one nostril, that means death is coming normally. But they use this process to rise above that, to rise above one's mortality, to rise above the physical body, to sit here, 
not being a body, so they block off the right nostril, breathe only through the left. So if you see a yogi like that, with bangles, green bangles on his left hand, and he looks little freaky, but he has no bivax in his right nostril, he is a man you should not miss, he is worth being with. But if you see him still with bivax, he is still work in progress. You mentioned Devi. Devi is in some ways more integral to Shiva, much more than any feminine divinity connected with Vishnu, or at least the form is different. Why Radha Krishna are there? Uh, at I, that's why I changed it a bit and said the form is a little bit different. I want to make a statement and then I want your reaction to this. We normally think of Parvati having performed tapasya to get Shiva as a husband. And it's described in the Shiva Purana also as it is in other Puranas. But Devi had been born as Parvati, as the daughter of Mena and Himalaya. So in some sense she had taken human form. So is it possible that this is also a metaphor for the human performing tapasya to approach a divinity rather than the pure, simple, standard statement of Parvati performing tapasya to get Shiva as a husband? And well, partly your reaction to that. And secondly, how important is Linga Bhairavi or Bhairavi or Devi to Shiva worship, Shiva Bhakti? See, uh, the most important thing is that which we are referring to as Shiva, or the one that we are referring to as Shiva, is not to be worshipped, is to be attained, is to be imbibed. So, this tapasya of Parvati, though she was supposed to be a princess, and she wants to attain him, in popular culture, a woman wanting to attain a man means marriage, but she wants to attain him. She doesn't want to be partners with him. She's not looking for a relationship, she wants to attain him, that is the sadhana. But he ignored. So, uh, she discarded her clothing and her food, two things which are very vital. Food is vital for everybody, clothing is particularly important for a woman. Both she discarded, she became a dviparna, only two leaves to cover herself, only two leaves to eat, only two leaves per day eating. No response. She dropped one leaf. She become, became Ekaparna. Only one leaf to cover herself, only one leaf to eat. Body became emaciated, but she continued. No response. So she became Aparna, no leaf, nothing to cover herself, nothing to eat. Then those who are watching know this is death. It's just a question of time. So not able to bear this, her mother Meena said, Oh Ma, enough. So she became Uma later on. <laughs> That's one of the names. It's like saying, Oh, enough. But it was not enough for her. But then Shiva yielded because 
You can call it whatever you want. She wants to attain him or die. You can call it suicide, you can call it sacrifice, you can call it sadhana. But she is in a condition where either she will attain, attain or she will end. So he cannot refuse that because she's gone beyond everything else of comfort, of sustenance, of shame, everything she's crossed. So the only way was to include her. He did not just marry her, he made her a part of himself, he became an Ardhanari. Half of him was her. That is not to be taken simply because she attained. She did not get him in marriage, she did not threaten suicide and somehow marry him as some people try to do <laughs> That is not how it needs to be looked at. So, it is about attaining Shiva, it is not about worshipping Shiva. People also think, I am a devotee of Shiva, I am not. I have never done Shiva pujas anywhere, except when I went to some temple, the priest will force me to do something, otherwise I don't know nothing. <laughs> it's just that he invaded my breath, became my… became my breath. I tried to sneeze him out, it didn't work. So I thought it's better to inhale and exhale. <laughs> so once somebody captures your breath, they've captured you. Suppose I hold your breath in my hands, you become my slave, isn't it? That's all that happened to me. Not a devotee, not a worshipper, <laughs> just a slave <laughs> I read somewhere you… about you speaking on the Shiva Purana, and you said it has references to the theory of relativity, to quantum mechanics, and we've forgotten all the signs and we only remember the rituals. Uh, would you care to expand on that, if I remember right? <clears throat> See, uh, like we already went through it in a very superficial way. When you say quantum, you're talking about a big leap. What is that big leap? From physical to non-physical from particle to wave. Now they know it is a big confusion, they don't know whether it's a wave or a particle, sometimes it's a wave, sometimes it's a particle. So essentially, you're always busy trying to make conclusions, and all conclusions are going wrong. In the hundred years' time, in the last hundred years, how many times you change your opinion on what is the basis of this creation? How many times? How many theories have come forth? This is because keyhole, because that's the only… science is committed to that keyhole study. It has its benefits, it has brought many benefits to our lives, no question about that, but it has its limitations. Fortunately, many great scientists today, many great physicists today understand this, they are clearly saying, we not only do not know, we shall never know. I bow down to this because this is wisdom. This is the basis of possible knowing. Because of the type of education they receive, they are not able to flip over to another way of knowing. Right now, we are using our intellect to know everything. Using our intellect means if you ask anybody, would they like to have a sharp intellect or a blunt one, everybody will say, we want a sharp one. So if you have a sharp instrument, what can you do? You can dissect. If you try to stitch, suppose you do surgery on somebody, you dissect it with a knife or a scalpel. When you want to stitch, you don't have a needle, you use the same knife to stitch, the man will be in tatters. He'll be ripped off. 
Well, this is the problem with the intellect. When you dissect, it reveals something to you. When you try to understand everything and try to stitch things together, it falls apart terribly because you're using a knife for everything. Your present level of education is only nurturing your intellect. Other dimensions of intelligence are completely ignored. So unless we invest in enhancing other dimensions of intelligence within ourselves, Trying to know these things in pieces and trying to stitch it together with one instrument, which is a knife. <laughs> Cutting instrument cannot be used for stitching, it's as simple as that. But we are trying to do everything with one thing. So there is a lot of confusion about this. Scientists are clearly saying what we are saying is not ultimate. But there are a whole lot of WhatsApp scientists here who think whatever nonsense they read on the social media is the ultimate science. Great scientists are saying, what we are saying right now is not everything, this is how much we know. But all the WhatsApp scientists, vouch, this is it, everything else is not science. So this is more because popular access to profound things make things… make profound things very profane. We started with a chant. All of us have heard you chant mantras, totrams. Do you have a favorite one? I'm talking about Shiva. Other than Om Namah Shivaya, that's <laughs> an obvious one. Uh, I have no favorite chants because I don't chant usually. Only in public places, when I want to start something, I start with a chant, because otherwise they'll be doing texting. The moment I chant, they will <laughs> In private, I never chant, uh, because for me, the ultimate chant is stillness and that's very simple and easy for me. I have no work to do on that. If I sit, it'll happen, I'm absolutely still. If I close my eyes, the world disappears, so I don't chant anything. I don't think Adiyogi ever chanted anything. Other people are chanting. There's a beautiful Zen story. See, if one knows how to be still, he need not chant, he did not worship, he need not do anything. But the moment I say this, a whole lot of people who are lazy, they will all think, yeah, I don't have to do, no, I just feel it like that. I will be just <laughs> still. No, 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 we will tell you when you should stop chanting. Right now you must chant, you must do asana, you must twist and turn and stand on your head and do all the nonsense because otherwise you'll deceive yourself. You'll deceive yourself, this is like if I ask you to climb this mountain. It's supposed to be seven hills. Uh, by the time you climb halfway through the first hill only, your knees and thighs will start singing, chanting maybe to start with. <laughs> then they start singing, then if you further climb, they start screaming. Then your mind will say, why are we just wasting time and energy going up? It's so beautiful here itself. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Recently, a few months ago, I was in the United States and uh, <laughs> this one man who's uh, married uh, with three children, having serious problems, it seems now they're going for a divorce. And he came and said, Sadhguru, do you remember Twenty years ago, I came to you, I wanted to take brahmacharya. 
<laughs> you told me to come and stay in the ashram for one or two years and then we will see. But instead I came to United States, I got married, I met this woman and I got married. Now he's got three children. Now he is wondering, oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> I told Sadhguru I want to take brahmacharya and I... He told me to come to the yoga center, I came to United States. Now I have three children and now it's gone all bad. Now divorce proceedings are on. <laughs> Ugly divorce happening. So like this people, if they're climbing the mountain, when their legs hurt, their priorities will change. <laughs> so because of that, sadhana is very important. No matter who you are, you wake up at five o'clock in the morning, five thirty, you be there for the sadhana. No, no, I am feeling meditative, it's all right. <laughs> Meditation is not something that comes once in a way. You must live it every moment <laughs> of your life. It's not like it's coming right now, I don't want to chant. When you chant, you chant. When you do asana, you do asana. When you hold your breath, you hold your breath. When you meditate, you meditate. Because without breaking through all the fanciful ideas that you have about yourself. See, the problem with every human being is no... Without exception, I am saying, no human being thinks they're ordinary. They're all special. Outside they will pretend humble, but in private if you see them, they are all very special. Special creatures must be beaten down to ordinary. More ordinary, more ordinary, more ordinary, one day they will become extraordinary. Yeah, that, that sounds like a core definition of bhakti. Um, does Isha get in the way of Sadhguru becoming still, is there a trade-off? No. I never let Ita, Isha Foundation get into me, I handle Isha Foundation <laughs> Sadhguru, I think… They take their time, but they can't take me <laughs> They take a lot of my time, but they can't take away who I am. If I did not have that assurance, I wouldn't get into all this activity. People wonder, why am I getting into more and more activity? More and more, the projects are going on like never before. Uh, because it doesn't affect me. I want it to work because it's useful for people, but personally it means nothing to me. All the projects, whatever they are, it's good if it happens, it'll make a big difference for people the spiritual infrastructure, the big movements that we are launching. We have a very large one coming up in 2024. All this must succeed because it's useful for the world. But personally, means nothing for me. I have not invested myself in any of that. I've invested my time and energy and my intelligence and my resource, but uh, who I am is not invested because who I am is a zero. What can you invest a zero in? Nothing. Only if one stands next to the zero, then zero becomes valuable. <laughs> Otherwise, I am nothing. Anyway, you want me to chant? I can chant. All right. I, th I thought you'd refused. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I never refused anything. But the, by the time I get to it, people think I've refused. <laughs> Even when I was born, my mother went with labor pains to the hospital three times. <laughs> but it looked like I was not coming. Three times she got admitted, three times she came back home. It seems twenty-three days beyond the gestation period. And when it happened, they couldn't take her to the hospital, it happened at home. So I was born at home. So I'm at home, you know, always. You're born in a hospital, you want to go home, born at home <laughs> mm. 
नगेन्द्रहाराय त्रिलोचनाय भस्मागराय महेशराय निय शुद्धा दिगंभराय तस्म नकाराय नम शिवाय तस्म नकाराय नम शिवाय Thank you for you being here. Thank you. Thank you.